Today's edition of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that I've been lucky enough to be using for a little over a year now. Only rivaled by the impeccable customer service that Kevin and his staff provides, Coach Me Plus's ability to constantly be amoeba like in their ability to mold and, and matriculate what you're trying to get across and bring together. Is, is absolutely fantastic. Their constant pursuit of better ways and better methods and, and innovations and progress to their own product is absolutely fantastic. Go over to coachmeplus.com, check out what they got, guys. It's, uh, it's something that I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down and talking about the field today and the state of the industry with no one other than Mark Watts. Mark and I start talking about, you know, how he's gotten to where he is, you know, his, his experience as a coach um, and how his stops, you know, in his work with Elite and the NSCA and coaching have, have impacted him today and, and, you know, as a guy on the outside looking in, like what he's seeing right now, you know, we, we then get into some of the issues and misconceptions in the field and talk about a whole variety of things. It's really, really a cool discussion there. And then, you know, we finish off talking about some things that he's had the best success with as a coach with his athletes that carry over into any field that have helped him become a better teacher uh, with the students he's working with now and, and how keeping, you know, the athlete the focal point of what we're doing is most important, you know. Guys, it's really a, an absolutely killer talk. I can't thank Mark enough for being so open and candid with everything. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Mark, thanks for being on with us today, my man. Jay, it is an absolute honor. It's been a while since we've talked, and I'm I'm just uh, I'm thrilled that, uh, that, that you would have me on talking. Yeah, man. Well, I'm stoked to get to this because I think now – you know, as we were just talking about, there's all these extremes and ebbs and flows when it comes to the coaching profession, and kind of the new sexy hot topic is is the art of coaching, mm -hmm. and that's something that you've seen at so many different levels from your work with the NSCA and Elite and being a coach and now being a, a teacher, mm -hmm. you know, so understanding these relationships and building things. So let's let's start talking about that kind of things that you've seen, things that have been good, bad, and different along your way and lessons learned of that sort. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because I, I kind of gone full circle. You know, I think I've said this before, you know, when you're a coach and, and, and you're in what I know it's, it's kind of a cliche, but when you're in the grind and every day, you know, it's, it's the ins and outs, you kind of get a little bit, um, you kind of have blinders on to other things. And some of those guys that, 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 um, are in it every day, might not have the time to step back and really look and reflect. And sometimes, um, you know, you, you get to the point where you figure out what you can do. You figure out what's the best situation uh, that you're in and what's going to help your athletes based on uh, your, your logistics and based on your resources. And then you do the best job you can. And I think it wasn't until after, you know, when I, I resigned in, in 2013 and I, I, you know, Dave had hired me on at Elite FDS, I was there for almost exactly two years. And that was just, what, you know, those two years, all of a sudden now I'm able to get, you know, and I know how much work it is to have a podcast because I remember, I mean, I had as many people as I could on there interviewing people, visiting people. Um, and you're able to kind of sit back and, and you ha you can reflect on, Hey, if I could do it all over again, you know, I would do it this way. And I don't think that if I never, if I were never step back, I, I don't think I would ever have, have grown uh, as a person, as a manager, as a, you know, as just a person in general. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously I, 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 I left the lead up the S and I became a fifth grade, uh, campus school teacher here on the West side of Columbus. And it just kind of like, that's just where I thought I needed to be, you know, and not to get too, too far involved, but that's just really where I need to be. I need to be, um, this is the next stage of my life. And I'm glad because I'm still able to, um, be able to be involved in the strength and conditioning. And again, I, like we talked before, I don't have any agenda. I don't have anything to lose. I'm allowed to say things because of all the mistakes I made, because of all the things I've gone through, because of all the people I was able to talk to um, that were in positions where it was it was tough for them. I'm I don't have anything to lose, so I can you know kind of express some things and, and really kind of look and, and without really being a hypocrite because I'll be the first to admit that I mean I've 
everything I've learned, a lot of them were from, from my mistakes. And I hope that other people can kind of learn from, you know, and I always say that anybody that you have working for you, anybody that you mentor should be twice the coach that you are because they have all your experience, all their experience, all their mistakes and all your mistakes. And that's, you know, they should be able to learn from that. So it was really um, a, a good situation. And one of the best things for me was when I became a teacher and I, you know, here I am, I did my student teaching in 99. I'm a 42 year old at the time. Uh, well, I was 43 at the, when I, when I first, uh, you know, became a teacher, I'm a 43 year old first year teacher that, that really didn't know anything. And you know this, and I think strength coaches around can, can probably see anytime you're a strength and conditioning coach and you get an interview, there's a lot of times, unless you're an assistant getting an interview, there's a lot of times that you know either way more than or at least just as much as the people that are interviewing you. So if I'm if I'm going to get a, an interview as a high school strength and conditioning coach, I know so much more than that, that athletic director and that principal about what it need what I need to do to be able to be a, a successful coach and make that that program better. Uh, same thing, you know, no one, no sport coach on whatever committee is going to know more than a strength coach on what the day-to-day uh, things that have to happen to be successful. Well, when I became, when I started interviewing for teaching jobs, that was not the case. This is one of the first times that I didn't think that, you know, whether I was interviewing for a football position or strength conditioning position, all of a sudden I'm interviewing things and I am not uh, the resident expert. I am, uh, I'm back low man on the, you know, for lack of better words, you know, low man and, and, and getting involved and I'm the beginner again. And I've really had to humble myself and humble myself and start all over again. And it was great for me because you really, anytime you have to step back and you have to start from scratch and you can kind of build what, who you are as a professional from the ground up, it's a great experience because it really humbles you. And, and, um, you know, and, and like I said, at the same time, I'm able to see some of these parallels with education and how it reflects in with, with coaching, because again, coaching is just teaching. And I think right now, when you ask about, and again, that was a long way for me to get around that question, but you asked about what am I seeing right now? I think strength and conditioning coaches at this time where information is abundant and um, we're almost overexposed, I think we're in a huge dichotomy. We're in a huge, um, uh, the, the continuum is uh, strength and conditioning coaches are fighting for whether it be recognition or whether it be to find who they are and to make sure that they understand or make sure that they can have value. And at the same time, in a profession that doesn't reward that, um, and, 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 you know, so it's a really, it's, 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 it's a double-edged sword that I, even when I comment on it, find myself being hypocritical. And, and let me, let me just, just, just hear me out. One thing we talk about when you talk about the art of coaching and, and for someone like you, Jay, that's been, that's been, you've done everything, um, you've earned where you're at right now. You're, you're one of the best out there and you, you, because you put the work in. But one thing we know that again, one thing that a strength and conditioning coach cannot do is take the credit for the success of his teams or his individual athletes. If he's in a, in a private sector on an individual basis, because again, it's one of those things that if I am a coach and if my team is successful because of my weight training program, well, why isn't all my teams, you know, successful because of that weight training program? And if, and again, if it's, if, if we are winning a championship because of the strength training program, then that means that if we lose, that's because of the strength training program, right? And again, if we win, it's, you know, it's, and again, it, it can't be that way, you know? And like I said, I don't want to take the blame for a loss because of, you know, I have a, a, a teenager that made a mistake in the fourth quarter of a game. And at the same time, it's not because of me that why that team is, is in that position. And I, and I always say, like, don't, don't steal the spotlight from the kids you're trying to spotlight. And whether it be from the private sector who has a D1 prospect, well, it's not the program. You know, it's, 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 if it was a program, then all your, all your athletes would be D1s, right? If you're in a private sector, you know, it's not, you know, so I think we have to really be humble about, you know, what it is. I mean, when, when you, you take two different programs, if you would happen to switch coaches, switch strength coaches from the top two programs, right, with a, a smaller program, would the results of that game be any better? And as, as, I mean, as you and I know that 
you know, <laughs> the, the number one factor that will, you know, predict success in a given sport is the ability to play that sport. And I think you and I kind of, you know, learn from some of the same people that, um, you know, maybe it's not the strength to everyone. Maybe you just don't have, you know, maybe they just had better players, you know, and the team with the better players is most likely going to win. And no matter how, no matter how awesome your mobility circuit is, no matter how much soft tissue work you do, no matter if you're using post-activation potentiation training in your program, uh, at the same, the kids got to hit the free throw late in the game, right? And so for a strength coach, we have to be very cautious about selling ourselves and taking credit for that. And then all of a sudden you look at the other side, which I've, I've, I've wrote about before, is that I think right now you combine that with there is no – still to this day, I had not hadn't heard anybody tell me that there is no quantitative, um, objective way to evaluate a strength and conditioning coach, right? Mm-hmm. You can't really evaluate them on – uh, you know, Max is in a weight room. You're not going to evaluate them on injuries, right? I don't want to take the blame or the credit for, for an injured athlete because there's so many other factors involved. Yes, as a strength coach, you're going to take it to heart. You can do everything you can to make sure that that's, uh, you're, we're doing everything we can to try to, you know, reduce the, the chance of soft tissue injuries, non-contact soft tissue injuries, but that's not how you should be judged as a strength coach. You know, you can't really say wins and losses. We already talked about that. Um, you can't really judge it on, you know, performance in the fourth quarter or conditioning or whatever. There's really nothing to say if someone replaces you tomorrow, Jake, how is the athletic director or the head basketball coach or whoever who is making decisions going to say, OK, this is the reason why Coach A is better than Coach B. How, what factors are they looking at? And really, and this is the, the, the second part of that, you can't evaluate them. And the people that are in charge of making those evaluations – don't have the knowledge or experience and they're outside of their scope. So they can't make those decisions anyway. So you have a strength coach that everybody's telling them like, be humble. It's, it's, you know, athlete success is not because of you, but then there's no way for them to actually um, display that they are uh, proficient at their job. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can be as many athlete surveys as you can, you can put through um, at the same time, you know, we know most of our, Everything as a strength and conditioning coach is process-based. and But the problem with being process-based and not outcome-based is that it's really tough to evaluate the process because there's those intangibles that we know in our hearts when we're doing a good job, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I went down to – I mean, if I watch – I went – I'm able to still visit some people. And if I watch you in the weight room training your athletes, it's going to take me five seconds – to know that you're doing a tremendous job because of the athletes and because of how they believe in what they're doing and how they believe in you and how they trust you. You can see that if you've been around long enough. But how do you how do you how do you how do you objectively evaluate that? And that's the problem. And that's that's kind of the, the double-edged sword that that every coach is is involved in. And that's why, you know, and that's why again it becomes the profession itself becomes undervalued. Because if I replace a strength coach, I can't tell whether that's a, 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 a better hire than the last guy or not, right? It's just because I trust, I know him and I trust him. And again, that's another reason why you can't blame coaches for whether it be, and you're, you're involved in that with, you know, football and basketball being the two sports where those um, coaches are going to bring their own guys in and they're going to, and I know I'm going along on this, but I, I just, the, the last point that I just thought about, like people blame a football coach for just bringing his guy in, right? And even if that coach on the surface may not seem like he might be the best fit or the best coach. Well, if you're a head football coach, how are you supposed to evaluate? How do you find, hey, we want to bring the best strength coach in the country to our program? How, what, what parameters are you setting for that? Mm-hmm. Based on what? Based on the past? What if they were just with really good teams that had really good players, Right? I mean, you do wins and losses. Are you doing like technique? Are you going to have them do a clinic? I mean, are you going to have them interview and have them coach an athlete for a day? So, of course, a a head football coach or a head basketball coach is going to bring someone in they trust because that's the only thing they control. Is there a personal relationship? So as a strength coach, you can't sit there and bark in the mouth that, hey, it's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. 
and then get disappointed when a, you don't get hired because you don't have a relationship, right? Yet we can't be we can't be hypocrites in that sense. So I think that's kind of where we're at with that. I think we just have to be kind of humble and we have to empathize with other people in other situations. So that was I I kind of blacked out there. I just I just I just. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's that's the problem that we've always been in, and I, and I don't think you see. I don't. I don't know if there's going to be a change in that in the future. Um, and again, I'll be the first to admit that I I hung in there as long as I could, and so I'm empathetic to what strength coaches go through. I know what these guys are going through from the stresses from family, the stresses from the day to day job. So I mean, I, I I understand, and I think it's one of those things where I don't know if we have a solution yet. Uh, but I think the fact that we have so much information out there. And people leading the forefront, and, and, and like this podcast right now, and the clinic you do in the summer. I mean, those are the type of things that we need in our profession. I think those are important. Well, appreciate that, man. And I think too, like piggybacking that. I think the scary thing when you talk about the coaching carousel and these relationships and all this and that. And I was actually talking to a coach uh, about all this a couple weeks ago. Is when people find out that coach whoever gets a job at team whatever the first thing they say is is he bringing his guy and if not do you know anybody and I think that the part that really frightens me when it comes to other people is that it's like we don't sit back and look at it and say but what if the guy who's still there is still there like we're really quick to jump in and almost just be like New coach, he's gone. I'm taking that job. Whereas really, like, could we almost get to a point where, like, something happens and it's like, oh, well, I know a guy there and I know a coach who's going there. He may not have someone. Why are we not calling to vouch for the people that we know are good already? Right. Especially since we don't have that evaluation ability. <laughs> I think that, like, the part that makes it tricky is that you're right. There is no way to evaluate it objectively. But there are some people out there that we all know are really, really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if those people might be bounced out just because, I think that going to bat for people, whether they're within your circle or not, if there's someone that you know that is going to that job, I think that that's something that us as coaches really need to take a step back and start thinking about. Well, it, it takes a little bit of, it, it takes courage. It takes some fortitude and it takes uh, the, you know, the ability to say, listen, the person that's already there may be your best option. Um, and, and based on, you know, based on just simple things, what if, what if it's your son or your daughter? Do you want your son and daughter, you know, would you want them to play for or would you want them, that person to be your strength coach? And I think that's a really easy, that's a really kind of easy analogy to say. And again, you know, I think it, it, it reminds me of a parallel. And I think you appreciate this where I fought really hard for about 10 years to, 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 to add a strength and conditioning position at a division three school where in even in the state of Ohio, there was only one out of the 24 Division three schools in Ohio, um, or, or however, there, however many there are, there's at least 20 or so. So I was fighting and fighting and fighting to try to add a position. But what I wasn't humble enough to understand was that even if they did add that position, which after I left, they end up adding it, I might not be the best person for that job, right? You know, just because my coach goes from a Division you know, a, a Division two school to a div Division one school as a coach, right? It might be a situation where I might not be the best person just because I'm his guy and doesn't mean that necessarily I might be the best for that situation. Hopefully, if it's a bigger school, what, what happens if they, they bring me along and keep the guy that's there? And I think that that's something that, you know, um, and I really had to, I really come to grips with that. You know, you fight, hey, we just, we need a strength coach and we need a strength and conditioning position here. There's a lot of high schools and, and small colleges that are going through that now. Well, be careful because when they do figure out that, hey, yes, we are going to add a position and they do a national search, are you a finalist? You know, and I think that's part of the, that's, that's part of it. But it takes a lot. And you're right, Jay. I think because of, 
you know, the worst coaches out there, you and I know both, we both know this, the worst coaches are the ones that are afraid to lose their job because they will do what it takes to keep their job. And that is not necessarily synonymous with what's best for the athlete and what's best for the program. You know, and I, I always say, like a strength and conditioning coach, the number one, the number one thing they have to be worried about is right the program, right, and then that team, and then you know, and then or a sport coach needs to be worried about the program, the team, and then the individual athlete. Well, a strength coach is almost the opposite. They got to worry about the, each individual athlete because sometimes there's not anybody else to advocate for them. Um, and I think that's one of those things that you know we as a profession have to be have to be realistic enough to understand that uh, you know our job is important but it's going to be about relationships it's going to be about you know what is best and we can't be afraid to say listen if if you can't be afraid to lose your job you can't be afraid and you cannot because we've we we both have seen it before you can't make decisions based on i need this job well if you have to be if you be if you have to become somebody else that you never wanted to become to keep that job, that's not the job, right? That's not the job. And I think, yeah, I understand what, what, what exactly what you're saying, where um, you have people that have families that have been invested in there, but all of a sudden the bottom line, you know, peeks his head through. And, and like I said, sometimes that bottom line becomes wins and losses and not what's best to make young men and women better young men and women. Yeah. And it's, it's funny, that, you know, you bring that up because it's, that's a situation that I think, Especially now with how the media is portraying this time of year um, with training one sport in particular, mm-hmm. that kind of getting out of your comfort zone and doing what you're told uh, by people who are above you um, mm-hmm. is leading to some problems. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree. I agree. And that's, you know, it, it, it depends on how much, how involved you are maybe on social media, um, you know, but again, I think anytime you hear a, a situation where you have, you know, situation in Oregon, and of course the first thing we do is we try to place blame and we, you know, we, 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 we really, we, we, we make a, a, a you know, a, a, we victimize or we make a, a, we villainize, you know, those people that are making those decisions and not knowing that there's a lot more to every situation than what the news media portrays. It was just, you know, and then you have an article about, you know, Notre Dame. Uh, and again, uh, we have to understand as strength coaches that the media is there to sensationalize. So whatever happened, whatever comes out of that, um, you know, that that article with the training of a certain school, that, you know, they're taking a couple quotes and not really giving you the whole big picture. And that not might not be really what's representative of what's going on. Uh, but I think, Again, I think that the thing that's happening with a lot of those schools is that, you know, the, the word competition, we got to compete, we got to compete. Everything we do is competitive. And again, I agree with that. I understand that. Um, but I think, and I think the problem is some of those, some of those schools are trying to replicate what some of the, so, some of the other elite level schools are doing and what we've, 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 and I'm all for competition, but I think we lost track. And as soon as we say, we got to get our guys to compete. So what we do is, we wrestle over a stick in the middle of practice, right? Or we have a tug of, tug of war or a rope or we, I mean, we've seen, you know, people, you know, you know, do these combat, you know, put them in a circle and sumo wrestle each other. Well, what about doing some just competitive things that have something to do with your sport? You know, one of the things that we've, that we figured out at a small school is maybe the, one of the best things we can do to get our guys to compete and still help them become better and improve performance was have them race. You know, what happened, what happened to, you know, you're, you want to be competitive about speed. Well, let's, let's race, right? Like we did, we did what, like, like my, you know, my kids do at a recess, right? But all of a sudden, like, no, we can't race. We have to make them, you know, I don't know, fight each other. And so we can, you know, get the whole team to jump on, on top of them and scream and yell. And, and I think we, we've got to, we've got to be realistic with what we're kind of, what we're, we're trying to ask our, 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 our young men and women to do, because again, for every athlete, you have to, you have to, you know, it goes back to the mental toughness question. You have to convince me that if I have two guys and they're tug of war, they're playing tug of war over a tire and one guy wins, what if he's not the better football player? What if, right? What if he's not the better player? 
I'm still going to play the better player that's going to give me a chance to win, right? And I think that that's you know something that that, that you have to make sure that what you're seeing and what you're doing and day to day is actually going to be reflective because if not, now your players just know that everything you're doing is just BS. You're just doing it for for YouTube and you're not doing it for because you want what's best for the team. You know, so I think I think I think coaches got to be careful with that. And you know, just because school A is doing it, well, school A can afford to do it. You know, school A can afford to do it because again, as soon as a five star recruit says I'm not coming here, they got a couple more that will. Uh, you know, if you're school B, you might not have to say yes. So. It's one of those things that you have to be really, really cautious of. Oh, no doubt. And I think that, you know, I mean, shoot, we could talk for hours about the whole mental toughness thing. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, that's kind of, um, that's kind of a scary topic almost, mm-hmm. you know, because I think that that's one that's been really like, it's kind of been bastardized in both directions now, you know, mm-hmm. where it's like, People maybe have gone a little too far with some things, and now it's almost like there's people that are so against doing things. I mean, at the end of the day, man, you know, I'm giving the ball to LeBron at the end of the game. <laughs> you know, if, if I'm a swim coach and I got to pick one dude to be at the end of my relay, I'm picking Phelps, you know, like, I don't care if you tell me they're the toughest cat on the planet or not. Bron's getting me a bucket, and Phelps is going to touch the wall first. Like, I and I don't know, as Keenan has said a, a billion times, I, I don't know if that set of 10 squats after the kick set is what made Michael what he is, um, mm-hmm. but he's just got it. And I think that there's some cats that, you know, you're going to tell me AI didn't have it? I mean, we're talking about practice, right? So, right, right, right. I mean, at, at the end of the day, that's like that's something that's gone like, and it has almost like polarized the whole industry. Yeah, and I think just because something is tough, and no one's saying that you can't do things that are hard. You can you can do things that are tough, mm-hmm. but the what you're trying to get from the outcome of doing something that is hard um, is that really getting you resiliency. If I'm doing this because my coach told me to do it, right? How, how are you going to say, well, the whole team has to wake up at 6 a.m. and perform ridiculous workout, right? The make-believe Navy SEAL workout at 6 in the morning, right? And it's not a Navy SEAL workout like I quote Dan John. If you want to do a Navy SEAL workout, join the Navy. That's <laughs> step one, right? Um, <laughs> but, you know, for me, it's like, you know, is that really mental toughness? That kid's doing that because you told him to do it. Mm-hmm. You told him to do it, and everybody else on the team is, is doing it. Is he really? Is that really mental toughness, right? What about the kid that? What about the kid that? You know, and again, that that does the right thing all the time. What about the kid that on Saturday night gets all of his teammates to leave that party just a little bit earlier before things get out of hand? When, when, when do we when do we talk about that being mental toughness? Well, what about the kid who's never missed a class the entire semester, right? Even though he has an 8 a.m., you know, five days a week, you know. So, you know, and like I said, it reverts back to like J.J. Billis' book with making your bed every day. And I'm not saying that that's going to make a difference, but those little battles I think are mm-hmm. are just because something is hard doesn't necessarily make you tougher, right, especially if you are required to do it. You're just obedient, right? You're just doing what you're told to do because – You've trusted that coach. And, and again, when I worked for Sean Griswold, one of the things he said to me is you can have these kids do anything you tell them to do. They will run through a wall for you literally if they trust you and they feel that what you're telling them to do is going to help them and help their team. So when you abuse that by saying we're going to do this because – and again, I've been there. I've said, listen, we're going to do this because no one else in our conference is doing it. I guarantee it. Um but it has to have a limit. It has to. There has to be something that's gonna. You have to bring it back full circle, back to what we're trying to accomplish as a team. And just because they listen to you and they're obedient to you, doesn't mean they're 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 going to be any more tougher. Uh, because again, you're just doing exactly what you told them to do. So I think again goes with that that same line. It's just one of those things that you have to just just be cautious about and be empathetic to their situation too. No doubt. And it could almost be just kind of. A- Bring it all back to center here from where we started. 
couldn't it almost just be that we need to be doing things that's going to build their confidence anyway? So mm. if they don't believe in what you're doing and they don't trust that what you're doing is helping them become better and they're not believing in you and believing in what you're doing, then they aren't going to be, they aren't going to trust in the training. So they aren't going to be in a, in a calm, relaxed state of confidence when there's a tick or two left and they got to hit a free throw. Yeah. You right. Know? And I, and I think it goes back to, you know, we as coaches, as soon as we get a new batch of freshmen or we get a first year player, or we get a new client, if we're in a private sector, you know, regardless, the first thing we want them to do is we have to make sure that they, number one, believe in what we believe, right? And then they will start to behave how we want them to behave and do the things, right, that's, that, that goes along with, that, with our vision, you know, and then all of a sudden they start becoming the better person, you know, and I stole this from, well, this is a that old thing that, that, that pastors use, and I stole this from my pastors, you know, all of a sudden they have those bees, you know, they, 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 they you know, you get them to believe, you get them to behave the way that, that you feel is conducive to, to, to achieving their goals, and then they'll become the person that they're capable of being, right? And all it says is that it's not what you make them do, it's, it's who they become because of you. But the one step that we all forget and we all um, and, and again, I'm guilty as anybody was that we don't do the first step and that is making them feel like they belong, right? They have to belong. They have to feel like this is part of their team. Hey, you have to prove yourself and you have to believe what we believe. Well, if, if they don't feel they're part of that vision, if they don't feel like, okay, we have a vision of what we want to do. Does it include that player? Does it include your freshman? If no, right? And I understand, like, I, I take a quote from Chris, Chris Doyle that he says the number one job he has to do is kind of um, reverse the recruiting process when he gets freshmen coming in, right? You know, because, again, uh, they're getting recruited. We want you. We want you. We want you. You're going to help our team. You're going to be awesome. We want you on our program. And then they get here, and all of a sudden, you are a freshman, and you got to earn your you got to earn your jersey, basically, mm -hmm. right? But I think you can do that, and I think you can do that if you're honest with those young young men and women. Um, if you make them feel like they belong and say you are a part of this team and you are a part of this and this is what we believe in and we feel that we are going to be better because of you. And again, that just comes down to empathy, knowing where they're coming from, knowing what, what, what they're, they're dealing with, and then be able to, 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 to understand what they're going through and understand how that relates to the rest of the team. And it's just about giving them love. you got to care about you know, who you are. And I know it's kind of, kind of cliche and I hate the old cliche. We got to build relationships. Well, how do you do that? What do you mean build relationships? You're not building. I mean, go ahead and build a relationship. Well, what, 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 what I got to, what do you, no, you be the person you're, you, that, that you're, that you're, you say you are, you have integrity to be the person that you say you're going to be. And then that's how, you know, Hey, we got to be, I want someone that's uh, we have to build trust. Well, I can't, I can't make someone trust me. All I can do is, is do what I do what I say, say what I do, all right, and always be the, the same person no matter what. And that's something that I just, you know, I was I was a lunatic sometimes and I was best friends sometimes and I was a bad coach because of it for a long time until I realized like be the same person all the time. These kids today, and I don't care if you're talking about a 22 year old uh, or you're talking about a 10 year old, most kids today, whether they're rich, poor, whatever, they don't have the stability in their lives. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you need to be as a coach is unstable. So for me, you know, getting them to understand that, you know, that you care about them, you can't build the trust without, you have to be who you are. You can't control their thoughts or feelings or their perceptions. You know, the old build relationships and, you know, make sure you're trustworthy. And that's, that's, that's just buzzwords. That's just, that's just cliche. It's all the things you do to become trustworthy and to become the person that they want to want to trust. That's that's where it starts, right? You know, you're, some people are putting the outcome before the process uh, when you're talking about those those you know the relationships and the trust stuff. No doubt, no doubt, Mark. That's an absolutely brilliant point and a killer way to bring it back full circle. This is absolutely a fantastic talk, brother. I'm glad we got to catch up today. I, I can't wait to get this up. People are going to love it, my man. 
Okay, Jay, I thank you so much for your talk. I'm sorry, I just kind of went off on the on, on it. I know, and I and I know just being you know, like I said, one of the best my my favorite interviews was when you were on on the Elite FDS podcast. And like I said, I just I I really I really appreciate everything you do and, and everything you do with with the clinic in the, in, the, in the summer. And I I gotta make it down. I'm a bad friend because I don't. I don't make it down, but I'm gonna make it down. I promise. One of the one of these years, and and uh, I I got I got to come see and and uh, I appreciate everything you do. Well, thank you very much, Mark. That means that, that means a real a real lot coming from you, brother. And you know, if anybody listen to this, if you don't have all those elite FTS podcasts on your phone right now, um, we're gonna put a link to it on the iTunes page right with us. So it's uh, there's some good stuff on there, man. It's absolutely killer content. Mark, thank you so much for spending the time with us today, brother. This is uh, fantastic, man. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. And we'll be in touch real soon, my man. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. Yep. And a huge thanks to Mark for being so open and honest with us today, guys. Just an absolutely super candid and super open talk about how he sees the profession, you know. No holds barred at all, just what he sees going on. And, you know, guys, a lot of things that we should really take to heart here and ways that we could, we could help ourselves and the profession get better. Uh, this guy's done so much for the field, and I'm, and I'm really excited that he's still involved and still willing to share as much as he did with us today. You know, it's, it, it, he really has done a ton, you know, not limited to, as we talked about, that Elite FTS Sport Performance Podcast. Guys, there's going to be a link to it underneath. If you haven't listened to all those, hop down there, listen to them, because there's just some absolutely timeless stuff in there. Fantastic work. Mark, thank you so much for being on today. It was, it was killer. Uh, and as always, guys, if you enjoyed it, Hit that like button on YouTube or iTunes or Podomatic or share it through the social media outlet of your choice. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it might be, guys, just trying to share great information. Questions, comments, thoughts, please post them below. We're just trying to get the best information we can out there to coaches, drive conversation, and keep helping people get better. So hope you guys enjoyed the talk, and we will be back next week with another awesome guest. We'll see you then.